It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is David Ross. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable John Sherman Cooper, Senator-elect from Kentucky. Senator Cooper, we're very happy to welcome you to Chronoscope this <coughs> evening. I'd like to begin by asking you, because of your experience in the UN, whether you think there's any chance for a truce in Korea now. Well, <clears throat> as of the moment, and immediately, I, I do not think so. Of course, there's always hope, but I, I don't look forward to any immediate truce. I, frankly, I've never felt that the Russians uh, want a truce. I think their action in the UN in recent days on the resolution, the Indian resolution, is good proof of that. Well, I'm not giving up hope, <clears throat> though. General MacArthur says that he thinks he has a clear and definite solution of the problem. Do you think, in view of that, that uh, General Eisenhower ought to consult with him now? Well, of course, that's a question for General Eisenhower. Uh, I, I, I would guess that he would, he would uh, find out what his plan is. I think he would do that, I think. Well, what steps do you think can be taken to put uh, pressure on the Chinese communists to want a truce? <clears throat> well, I think you've always got to think of this Korean question as, as part of the, of the uh, larger difficulties between Russia and the rest of the world. And that you, you start out by knowing it's, it's a difficult problem, a very long problem. Because we are the real force there, I, I believe that we have got to have the strength in Korea which will give the greatest uh, influence to our position. Well, well, what are some of the steps uh, that would increase our strength, Senator, do you think? Not knowing myself what the military dispositions are there, uh, I, I'm not certain as to what, uh, how much should be added, but if we're to, if we're to convince Russia, and Russia primarily, that, that they cannot win and that they must adjust the position in, in Korea, then I think we've got to have the strength. Further. I, I certainly favor the, the proposition of General Eisenhower that as quickly as we can, we build up the strength of the South Koreans. And then I would urge strongly that every bit of influence that we can bring to bear upon the other members of the United Nations should be brought uh, to get from them added military strength, added economic strength. Well, Senator <coughs> Cooper, our viewers, of course, tonight are thinking about the USS Helena out in the Pacific and all of this uh, meeting that's going on out there. Uh, now, sir, first of all, uh, uh, why do you think all of these cabinet members are being rushed out to see General Eisenhower and carried aboard uh, by helicopter and so forth? Well, it's a, it's a good operation. <laughs> well, it doesn't, seem, so. a little, doesn't yeah. seem a little melodramatic yeah. to you. Uh, I wonder no, I don't it. think so. I think it's very practical. Uh, in the first place, everybody is interested in Korea. He's, he's just been there. He's got whatever information that he could get there. And I think it's with his experience that, uh, that he has got uh, new information and perhaps a much clearer viewpoint. But Mr. Dulles has been in Washington conferring with the State Department, and he has their view. And now they meet together and as a chance to bring together those diff different viewpoints. But from a very practical viewpoint, I think it'd probably be the best opportunity he'll have until he takes the oath of office, and perhaps for a long time after that, to get as many of his advisors together and have the chance uh, to confer without interruption. Well, well they're talking about other things besides Korea then. I would think so, yes. yes. Well, it's so a very one fine of thing. One of the things that makes you interesting to our viewers, I'm sure, is uh, you're a Republican who's just uh, been elected to the Senate down in Kentucky, and I believe that you are the only Republican that was elected to the Senate. 
in a state that did not vote for Eisenhower. Is that correct, sir? Well, that is true, but it just lacked a few votes of voting for Eisenhower. Out of about a million votes, Mr. Stevenson carried Kentucky by only 700 votes. And, and yet, uh, though Stevenson carried the state, you were elected to the Senate uh, by, what, what was your majority? About 29,000 votes. Now, uh, let me ask you this, sir. Why were you elected to the Senate? Uh, what did you have that General Eisenhower didn't have in the, down in Kentucky? Well, I'd like to make it plain that <laughs> I probably wouldn't be here on this program if General Eisenhower hadn't been a candidate. But that but great why, why do you sweep think of his gave uh, me the chance. But why do you think you, you ran ahead of the ticket in Kentucky, sir? Mm -hmm. Is it because you are well known? Well, been to the I, Senate I have. Before? This is, makes the third race I've made for the Senate in six years. And of course, I, they do know me. And uh, I would hope that I was in the Senate two years, and I hope and uh, they approved of my record there. You are. Then I was on the ground making a fight all the time. General Eisenhower came into Kentucky one day. If we could have got him back, he would have carried Kentucky. But for about eight or nine months, I was on the ground every day making the fight. Well, now, uh, the Republican Party, is it strong in Kentucky, and is it a growing party there? One of the things that, <coughs> questions I'm always asked is, and you are a Republican from Kentucky. Uh, actually, uh, Kentucky has a rather strong Republican Party. Out of about a million registered votes, we have a registered vote of about 425,000 registered Republicans. And we cast a <coughs> consistently a good Republican vote. Since 1900, we've had five out of the 15 governors. But you're about the first Republican who's been sent to Congress uh, by Kentucky in 25 years, weren't you, in 1946? Uh, well, in 1946, uh, I was the first one who had been elected to the Senate. To the Senate. And, and 25 years. Yes. Well, coming from a border <coughs> state as you do, sir, and from a state that has a strong Republican Party, what do you think of the Republican Party's chances? of making the South uh, a real two-party system yes. in the South. <clears throat> My state is, as you said, a border state. And, and, and in that uh, category, you could class West Virginia, uh, Missouri, Oklahoma, and I think even Tennessee. I think that all of those states, those four states, have possibilities to become Republican states, or to at least to be in a position where they could uh, turn Republican majorities uh, much more often. And I think there that's a problem of getting more interest from the outside, from the, in Kentucky and these border states and in the parties in those states, watching their leadership, uh, having good programs and, uh, uh, and uh, doing their best to develop their own party. I think the situation in the South is different. I, while our state is not typically a southern state politically, we have some of the same problems. We have the problem of not having local and state administrations, which give you continuity. What I think can be done in the South is to take advantage of the Eisenhower victory, uh, to take into the leadership some of the Democrats who voted and for General Eisenhower, to take into that leadership even more Im uh, importantly, the young people who came under his banner this year. Did Eisenhower well, Senator, attract? although you were a Republican, you have been serving as a delegate on the UN, haven't you, uh, under the, as an appointee of the Truman administration? Yes, I served as a delegate and, in 1949. And, and because of your experience there, I'd like to ask you some questions about the UN. First, do you think the United Nations is a success? Well, it's, <coughs> it's not a success in the terms that people had hoped. I think it's had a success, so I think its great success is that it's, it's been an instrument, instrument which has held together uh, the nations who are members, other than the satellite nations and Russia, and kept them pretty generally up on together uh, as, as, as against Russian domination and aggression. Well, hasn't one of its chief effects been to act as a sounding board for Russia and propaganda against the United States? Yes, it's given Russia a forum. It's also given the United States, Great Britain, smaller countries a forum. Also, it has given uh, the other nations of the world, uh, at least the representatives are there, a chance to uh, see the Russians, to hear them, and to analyze 
their propaganda. And I think that's been of definite value. <coughs> well, sir, our viewers, yes. I'm sure, would like to have your views on what the Republican Party is likely to do on domestic issues on January the 20th. First of all, sir, do you believe that the Republican Party will reduce taxes? <coughs> I think it will take the steps which will lead to reduction of taxes. I think reduction of taxes depends, as we all know, upon what happens in Korea, in the general war situation. Do you, do you think that the, uh, that the Republican Party will attempt to repeal any of the so-called social legislation that's been built up by the new and fair deals? Uh, in detail, there may be uh, specific laws that will be repealed. In general, I think the uh, general programs of Social Security, of uh, the wage and hour law, uh, some labor le legislation, uh, well, some general social programs will be maintained, but they'll be examined and analyzed. Well, now you come from a state that has <coughs> a considerable labor vote. Do you think that there'll be more strikes under a Republican administration than they have been? I have the belief that there will be fewer strikes. And I, I think we've al already seen some evidence of that since the uh, election, that some strikes are being settled. The reason I say that is I believe that when labor knows, and capital as well, but I think particularly labor because I think it's generally understood that they've had a, uh, a I think, a stronger advocate that, and the merits always uh, should provide when they know now that they've got to do what they say they want to do, bargain collectively, well, then you're going to have better chances for agreement. Well, well, I'm sorry, sir, our time is up, and thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable John Sherman Cooper, Senator-elect from Kentucky. Under any Christmas tree, it's the little packages which intrigue. What can it be, we say? And this Christmas, many hope that in one like this, there'll be a Longines, the world's most honored watch. Truly, throughout the world, no other name on a Christmas watch mean so much as the name Longines. In the whole world, there are few watches to equal Longines in quality and none of such great renown. Among the finest watches of the world, Longines alone has won 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 Gold Medal Awards, and so many honors for accuracy. Now, if this Christmas you wish to give the gift of great prestige, why not a Longines? Every Longines watch is superlative in styling, superb in finish, unsurpassed for faithful timekeeping. Yet unbelievably, you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as seventy-one fifty. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is David Ross speaking for your regular host, Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Tuesday nights, there's suspense on the CBS television network.